aquatic predators than sharks. And factory farm chickens are eating more fish than all the puffins and albatross in the world's oceans. 40% of all the fish is channeled into that. And now the Norwegians and Japanese are talking about mass harvesting of plankton in the southern ocean in order to turn it into a protein paste to feed the cows and pigs and chickens. Well, the problem is, this plankton, of course, zooplankton, phyloplankton, there's a very uh, intimate rela relationship there, and phyloplankton provides the oxygen that we breathe. So not only are they now taking the food out of our, uh, the, the mouths of all of those creatures in the sea, now they're going to go into after our oxygen supply, and there's no regulations or no concerns to stop them, because the bottom line is they're going to make a profit, and profit seems to you know, trump all other considerations when it comes to that. So we have to look in on sharks. Now sharks are a good example. We're, we're, people know what we're doing with whales, but our projects with sharks, uh, it's very difficult to get support for that because people have been conditioned to view sharks uh, as uh, monsters, thanks to Steven Spielberg. And uh, the fact is, is that the average number of sh people that are killed by sharks every year, by the way, for your information, is five. Five people killed by sharks every year. The average number of people killed by ostriches every year is 100. So ostriches are 20 times more dangerous than sharks, but we're not going off killing off the ostriches. And in fact, it's more dangerous to play golf than it is to go diving with sharks because more people die every year struck by light, light, lightning on golf courses than are killed by sharks. And in fact, the average number of people killed by coke machines falling on them every year is nine. So coke machines are more lethal than sharks. So we have to understand where this is relative to our positioning with them. And so we create these monsters and then we justify them. But the shark, the shark has shaped evolution in our oceans for 450 million years. Every fish that you see in the ocean, its color, its camouflage, its speed, its behavior has been molded by the shark. It's the apex predator. We need it. And if the shark disappears, it's going to upset the ecological balance in our oceans. And for this monster that we view on it, how many of them do we kill every year? 75 to 90 million. And that's to go primarily to provide uh, a product which has no nutritional value at all, and that is shark fin soup, which is uh, just a status symbol. So we're wiping out the species just in order to impress our friends and neighbors. And uh, that is, again, an indication of what we're doing to our planet. Now, when I hear people say, well, you know, we've got to kill the seals because the seals are eating all our fish. Well, in fact, you know, they're just a scapegoat for our overfishing. When uh, European explorers first arrived on the east coast of North America, there were 40 million seals on the east coast, including walrus, which are now extinct on the east coast. 40 million seals and no shortage of fish. Why? Because if you want a healthy fish population, you need a healthy predator population. But no, humans have decided to play God, and we'll decide who will live and who will die. And you know what? Over the last 200 years of this so-called manipulation of nature, we have proven to be quite idiotic. We don't know what we're doing. We just simply create one problem after another. Let's let nature take care of itself without our intervention, without our interference, because really homo sapien is nothing more than homo ignoramus arrogantus. And uh, we have to learn that lesson. And I feel that, you know, I know that people say, well, I'm anti-people, and yes, I am, because I, I tend to think that people are the problem, and uh, all we have to do is straighten ourselves out. And, um, get a little self-therapy or species therapy and learn to understand that we are part of this planet. We are earthlings and we're equal, equal, not better, equal to every other species on this planet because we need them. And when we start acting like we're superior to everything else, that's where it all goes wrong. And uh, so for the most part, we don't think about these things. It's out of sight. It's out of mind. Look at the things that we do look on as what is valuable. For instance, Imagine walking into the city of Mecca and spitting on the black stone. <laughs> well, your chances of walking out of that town alive are pretty remote. And nobody's going to have much uh, sympathy for you because you committed an act of blasphemy. You attacked something which is sacred to a group of people. Or I walk into Jerusalem and start hacking away at the wailing wall with a pickaxe. You're going to be in serious trouble. You're going to get an Israeli soldier's bullet in the back, and everybody will say you deserved it. You attack something which is sacred to a group of people. But each and every day we go into the most profoundly mysterious and sacred and beautiful cathedrals of the world, the redwood forests of California, the rainforests of Amazonia, the Great Barrier Reef off of, Cal off of Australia, and we totally desecrate and destroy these cathedrals. And how do we respond? Protest signs or a few letters to a few politicians. That's pretty much it. Because in our reality, the rainforests and the Great Barrier Reef and the redwoods are not as valuable as a chunk of old meteorite in Mecca or an old wall in Jerusalem, because these are 
anthropocentric values. You know, a few years ago when the Taliban blew up uh, some Buddhist statues, uh, everybody was outraged. They said, oh my God, you know, how dare you do that? And you know, but the one group of people who were not outraged were Buddhists. As the Dalai Lama said, they're just stones. Why are you so upset? And that, because see, our mindset, our Western mindset is if humans created it, it is valuable. And if nature created it, it's to be destroyed as long as somebody's making money off it. So this is a value system that we have to, we have to change. The fact is, is that we have to protect this planet. And the only way we're going to do that is through the passion of our interventions and by standing up for the planet as aggressively as we can. Now what I call what we do is aggressive nonviolence. We don't hurt anybody, but we do damage property, and property which is used to take life, I have no problem destroying. And in fact, um, a few years ago, I had a Tibetan Buddhist monk give me a little statue, and he said, I've been asked to give this to you, put it on your mask, which I did. And uh, I didn't know what it meant, but I asked, uh, I had the opportunity in 1989 to meet with uh, the Dalai Lama and ask him about it. He said, oh yeah, that's, uh, it's called Hayagriva, found out he sent it to us. And I said, well, what does that mean? And he says, well, it's a symbol for the compassionate aspect of Buddha's wrath. Okay, well, what does that mean? And only the, the Dalai Lama looked at me and says, well, you never want to hurt anybody, but sometime when they cannot see enlightenment, scare the hell out of them until they do. 